Yes. <laughs> um, the another. <laughs> I'm not. This is not a bet. Yeah. It's not a comedy bet. I'm doing. Hey, what's going on? And happy Thanksgiving, everybody. For First We Feast, I'm Sean Evans, and you're watching Hot Ones. It's the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. And today we're joined by Rob Lowe. He's an actor, producer, and director who in his 40-year-long career has touched everything from timeless films to Emmy Award record-breaking TV shows. He's also releasing new podcast episodes of Literally with Rob Lowe, as well as Parks and Recollection, a Parks and Rec recap series alongside Alan Yang. And don't forget to check out 911 Lone Star, which returns to Fox on January 3rd. Rob Lowe, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm really, I'm, I'm very hungry. And I'm curious, how are you around spicy food? I know that you like sinus clearing salsas. I do. I like I like all sinus clearing foods. Um, I'm a sweater. You should know that. There's we'll not, find there's out. not yeah. like a medical condition. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> so like if it, it, it's it's I'm one step away from that scene on broadcast news <laughs> when I get really hot. So that could happen. Um, but here's a little inside baseball. We're shooting this very early in the morning. Mm-hmm. This would for sure be the earliest I've ever had spicy food like this. For sure. Is there a referee that comes in and goes, you didn't eat enough? Just the people. You know, just the people. Just the vox populi. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I didn't come here. Oh, okay. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? That's not nothing to start with. No. That's not nothing at all. <laughs> so between literally with Rob Lowe and Parks and Recollection, you've done a deep dive into the world of podcasting. And yeah. I appreciate how you really know how to give the audience what they want from famous people talking to famous people. Thank you. How Now that you're on the other side of the right. interview table, what is your general approach to hosting these kinds of conversations? Well, I grew grew up when you could go on talk shows and they, they were an exploratory exercise, right? And people could crush or they could flame out. But what they weren't were these robots who came out publicizing the latest Marvel movie soundbite driven hack fest, which is what, that's why you're so successful and why this world is so fun because you can't survive this without revealing yourself. And so my, my whole thing on my show is just two people talking and you forget you're being interviewed and then the audience feels like they've had dinner with you and got to observe it. That's my way to do it. The other thing I do is, I never ask, I'm not interested in like the obvious stuff that they've been asked 5,000 times. There's a sweetness involved. It's good though. I'm approaching DJ Khaled area, are I not? <laughs> yeah, you're flirting with the, the Mendoza line, the Khaled <laughs> line here that we have in the three spot. <laughs> So in your book, Love Life, you make an interesting point about how James Gandolfini was able to humanize a monster in Tony Soprano by his use of, as you put it, one of the most difficult actor tricks of all time, eating food on camera. Why do you think it's important for the audience to actually see Tony Soprano wolfing down a submarine sandwich while planning out a hit? Two reasons. One is you don't see it. Like one of my favorite games when I watch anything is to watch actors fake eat. Like if something's boring and my wife is watching it and I don't want to, I'll entertain myself by trying to find actors fake eating and it happens all the time. They'll cut to them and they'll be like this. It'll, it'll literally look like this. And they'll be, and like, you cut to me. That's the thing about it. You gotta have, you didn't, they didn't eat. They acted like they ate. <laughs> what you never see is this. Never see it. And the reason is you're shooting the scene from 70 different angles that if you were to do that, you would be literally ill. But the other thing is that it, it does humanize you. It's like, it, there are things that we all do. So anytime you can do that, the audience relates to you. And, um, and he was the best. His whole character for me was predicated on just eating like a slob. And it's one of the great, great performances of all time, I think. Hoffs. 
a very jaunty chapeau. Yes. <laughs> There will be blood, the movie. There yeah. might be water. There will be water. Yeah, there, there will be water. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So you have the privilege of working alongside generations of best-in-class comedy minds from Lorne Michaels to Farley and Spade to Mike and Dana to Amy Poehler, and that's kind of just off the top of my head. Right. Why is your comedy North Star? If I pitch something to my wife and she doesn't like it, I do it. Oh, yes. I, first of all, I thought you were. I thought you were just saying that I didn't know that was a quote of mine. And I was like, yes, I feel exactly the same way. My, <laughs> You're like, that sounds smart. Like, oh Whoever my God, said that's same. a genius. Yeah. My wife's a comedy <laughs> idiot. That's amazing. How did that work out? Um, and by the way, and I say this on my podcast, I can say anything because my wife has no interest at all in anything I do. So like, she's not going to see this and be mad at me. How did you say that I don't know anything about comedy? It's good to go. We can just go after her. Um, part of it is she loves me so much that she doesn't want me to look like a fool. And... If you're not willing to look like a fool in comedy, you might as well not even bother. And like the more of an idiot that I can look like, the more I like it. And like when I did the uh, Comedy Central roast, right? I went to her and said, hey, they they want to roast me in Comedy Central this year. She's like, you can't do like that. You'll you'll look like an idiot to the nation. I said, honey, that that ship has sailed. (laughs) But she sat there and she sucked it up and I had the time of my life. I had the best time of my life being roasted. Like, I can take it. I love it. Well said, Rob. Are you ready to move on here to the next wing? Yes. Los Calientes. Speaks for itself. Yes, it does. Literally. Works literally. Literally. (laughs) This very much is like earthquakes. You go, you go, and he goes, is there more? Is, Is this the big one? One of my favorite stories that I've ever read about anyone that I'm interviewing is when you heard that your show, The Lion's Den, was going to get canceled by the network. You worked to rewrite the ending to be as absurd as possible. When you look back on that, do you think of it as an act of artistic expression or an act of rebellion? Both. 100%. It was like, you know, and and the show was a, I mean, a good version, I thought, but a a very network programmer, heroic young lawyer who's fucking the system, we turned him into a literal psychopathic (laughs) murderer who'd been murdering people secretly throughout the entire show that you'd already watched. And in the last episode, Kyle Chandler comes in as I'm eating dinner and I take the steak knife and I stab him to death, open up the window and commit suicide by jumping off in the end of series. It was like John Grisham as it started and then with Stanley Kubrick as it ended. (laughs) And the studio hated the show so much. They're like, great, sounds great. Like they didn't say one thing, we told them what we were gonna do. Um, those air, those those episodes never aired. Right. But every once in a while, um, I'll get somebody from like Lithuania <laughs> who'll be like, my family love stabbing the Kyle Chandler. That, that was the worst Lithuanian accent anyone's <laughs> ever done. You get the point. Um, somewhere in Eastern, Eastern, Eastern Europe, European bloc countries it aired. You did a deep dive in the book. I'm very impressed. Vive la revolution. I don't want to jinx it. Talk about it. I want to jinx it. It tears you. It I don't zaps want to jinx you. It. Mm-hmm. I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> All right, Rob, we have a recurring segment on our show called Explain That Graham. We do a deep dive on our guest's Instagram, pull interesting pictures that need more context. And for you on today, the Thanksgiving By the, can special. Can I say something? Your eyes are watering, sir. You know what? I'm not immune to it. I, I've done this a lot. I've done this a lot, but they get to me the same way. They get My to me eyes. the same way. Clean. My eyes watering? No, not at all. Not at all. What was your most memorable run-in with wildlife while filming Holiday in the Wild on location in Africa? Oh, the, the elephants. We filmed with wild African elements. It's why we went to Africa. We didn't want trained elephants because Kristen Davis, who's my co-star, is a big elephant activist, doesn't believe in it. So they're super dangerous. People get killed by elephants all the time. And I can remember there's a scene where we go take a picnic by a lake and the elephants come out of the out of the bush. We had to wait until they would naturally do that, which we knew it would be at a certain time of day, but we had to be ready. And then we all got out of the cars and we were the only ones let out and everybody else had guns. And so we were surrounded by guns in case something went wrong. And it was just the two of us as 60 elephants came out of the, the brush and 
you know, if they charged you, you got to hope those guys can shoot straight. And you saw the giraffes fight. First day in South Africa, I immediately go out on a long run and I turn the corner and this is what I saw. I'm tired, I'm sweaty, I'm running. And these two, excuse me, little fuckers are <laughs> going, look at them, look, look. And they are going ham. And I never knew that giraffes fought and I certainly didn't know that they fought with such violence. And I ran off. I was, I was filming it because it was so incredible, but I was also like, dude, you should just get out. Are you ready to move on here? This is the uh, Senor Lechuga here in the sixth spot. Lechu what? what I Sen Senor Lechuga. Uh -uh. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming. Clearly, this is like post halftime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've changed the game. At halftime, the game plan was changed. It was. And now uh, it's I a much more aggressive sort of full court press Yeah, here I need to adjust the second my half. game. Yeah. <laughs> Can I make the adjustment and win? <laughs> so when Anthony Mackie was on the show, he had some thoughtful things to say about why he believes the second and third leads are oftentimes the best characters, which reminded me of your quote. The best part is not the biggest, but the one that's most memorable. What is it that you love about doing scenes in which you only have one line? Well, on the West Wing, there would be times when I would be in a seven page scene and it would come to the end and I would, my line would be, thank you, Mr. President. That was it. For fans of the show, John Spencer said that a lot and, and I always admired him because no one could do more with thank you, Mr. President than John Spencer. He could make thank you, Mr. President mean, I love you, I don't agree with you. He could make it mean I'm angry with you. He can make it mean I'm not gonna do that. And that's a very specific thing. And, and I love seeing performances where actors have one line. There's, a, there's one that comes off the top of my head in, um, in Glorious Bastards. They execute the Nazi and right as they're about to execute him with the baseball bat, they go, you got a medal on you, what is it for? And he says, valor. And they kill him. There's one, one line, valor, crushes it. And I, and I love finding those performances. Oh boy. All right. Yeah, it's okay. We're definitely in the area where, like, I'd be like, these are too hot. Yeah. You and me both. You and me both. No, I'm like, I'm not, like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not eating this. <laughs> not for me. It's not for me. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Mm -hmm. It's in my hair. Soon it will be on my forehead, and soon it will be pouring for America to see. There will be water. There will be water. There will be water. <laughs> <laughs> I've abandoned my water! <laughs> That's a deep dive of the movie. Is it true that the cow tipping scene in Tommy Boy came about with you regaling the movie's writers with tales of that time-honored Midwestern tradition of tipping cows? 100%. So I'll never forget, I was playing tennis with Lauren, and he says, I think I have an idea for a movie for you and Farley. I was like, what is it? He goes, it's the two of you's brothers. And that was it. There was nothing more. And then six months later, there's a script. I thought they should go t cow tip because it was Midwestern. I remember that was a thing that drunk high school people did. They thought it was complete bullshit. They thought it was not a real thing. And <laughs> people who know, know it's, it's a thing. And then is there any truth to the internet rumor that Madeleine Albright once crashed the set of West Wing at three o'clock in the morning in a robe to accost you guys? <laughs> For not for being too loud and for not having a Secretary of State character. Okay, first of all, it's conflating many different urban truths. legends. What? Okay. Yes, Madeline Albright absolutely came to the set very, very late. We're shooting at the Kennedy Center. She w wanted to meet everybody, and, and she was se sitting Secretary of State. We we're like, uh, okay. So there's that. Then there is the. I was in the White House with Bill Clinton and was summoned to the National Security Director's office, who was a really gnarly, like tough, bare knuckle dude um, named Sandy Berger. He's like, sit down. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm fucked. This has gotta be about like my taxes. <laughs> and he was like, why is there no National Security Advisor in your show? So I was like, this is what this guy's thinking about? <laughs> in the middle of the day? 
Well, I'm sweating. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm <laughs> like, you promised water and there's water. If this were a regular show, I would be like, come powder me. <laughs> we can offer that, Rob. No, no, I'm, how about red this? Red carpet treatment. How about this? Sure. Because we're so, I can see the end zone. Yep. I can see it. Yep. I might eat the whole thing. Oh, you hear that? <laughs> yeah. you hear that? That was amazing. That was our producer, that Dom, That was amazing. Going, oh my gosh, don't that was do it. Oh my God. That was awesome. <laughs> and now I'm rethinking it. Is it time to take the jacket off? It might be jacket time. Come back in. Well, it's all... Oh, bro. <laughs> it's all hot sauce. There's... That's a crazy one. That's a crazy one. Oh. The fuck is happening? <laughs> It was like, fine, 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 kill you. <laughs> yeah. Milk's, <coughs> Milk's a good idea after that one. <sighs> but we'll rumble. We'll rumble. <laughs> yeah. it, it can't get any hotter than that, yeah. right? No, you're right. I think that that's maximum levels. That's maximum <sighs> levels. How do you think that your career in Hollywood shaped you as a junior high basketball coach? <laughs> I read that you draw inspiration from iconic sports movies like Rudy to inspire players at halftime. The another, and I'm not. This is not a bit. This yeah. Is not a comedy bit. I'm doing. Yeah. If there's, if there's, if there's talking to be done, <laughs> there's only this way to do it. Mm -hmm. This is not a bit. I'm honestly not doing a bit. I I think that hot. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, sports uh, halftime speeches are <laughs> the amount of water coming off me is yeah. amazing. Are, are, are like a part of acting's Mount Rushmore. There's Kurt Russell and Miracle. There's Hoosiers. There's Rudy. I was a, a coach for my son's teams, and I was very much like always trying to give them the rah-rah speeches like that, they, they were too young to care. They, they were not interested. <laughs> this is hot. We're almost ready to go to the next one. Because it can't get any worse. Right. Can it? That's true. And and you've, you've tore, it's scorched earth in your mouth, you know, so it's impossible. What's amazing is it keeps coming in waves. Yeah. Like first it blisters mm -hmm. your tongue. Then it closes up your throat. Then your eyeballs pop out. <laughs> Right. And, and then your tears ejaculate. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. I'll keep an eye out on this side of the table. It is unbelievable. Okay. <sighs> okay, I, I think we can go to the next one. All right, this next one is Hellfire's Cranked. We are almost to the finish line. Wait a minute. Yeah. <clears throat> I took two bites. There you go. Don't say that I was trying to <laughs> play. And maybe after the last one, a little bit. But you gotta chill. You just gotta chill. Zen out. You gotta chill. You gotta. Just gotta relax. Feel the vibe. Relax the spice. Mind over PCU. matter. you. Rip. <laughs> Coverage. <laughs> drip. So I know that Sasquatch has long been a topic of fascination for you ever since you saw the legend of Boggy, Boggy Creek, Creek as a child. And then in 2017 with your sons, Matthew and John Owen, you did the Low Files for A&E where you continued to hunt for Bigfoot and other sorts of unsolved curiosities. When you go on an adventure to find Bigfoot, do you rely on resources or maps of any kind? Or is it one of those things where you just pack some supplies and walk out into the woods? Oh no, you gotta know where, you, you can't just, you have to fish where the fish are. And my thing is, I don't know if any of it is real or not, but I will say that being curious about it and believe in, and it makes it more fun. 
Like, I, I don't want to be shut off to that. Like, dude, Scooby-Doo and Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, are my two favorite shows ever. So The Low Files was that show in a blender. Right. It was literally us going to places, eating stupid food, and looking for creatures. And the fact that A&E bankrolled it <laughs> was one of the great great things. I could have done it for 100 years. <laughs> well, what a win in your career, Rob Yes, Lowe. yes. Uh-oh, what's happening? You're shaking something. That can't be good. I'm competitive. <laughs> so I'm going to do it. <laughs> it's chemicals. There's nothing but chemicals in here. <laughs> right, right. S open, it's like acid. R yeah. This whole back half, it accelerates quickly. L look at how slow them. I'm going to do this. <laughs> like, I'm going to do it, but I'm not stupid. Yeah. There we go. That's plenty. That's plenty. That's plenty. Oh. It's on there. Technically, it's there. I did it. It's, it's there. on there. I'm trying to get as much off as I can. <laughs> Cheers, Rob. Cheers. What this, a ride. This is amazing. I'm going down. <laughs> oh, bro. I know. Going through it. Going through it. I'm getting down into my gizzard. Quickly as I can. <laughs> well, you know what? Speaking of gizzards, Rob Lowe, we are closing out yet another Hot Ones Thanksgiving special. And the only way to truly put a bow on this thing is to hit you with a quick guide to celebrating, according to Rob Lowe. Oh, please. Pumpkin pie, apple pie, pecan pie, or some other kind of pie? All of them. All of them. Big That's pie. A Sophie's guy. choice. <laughs> I'm not, I, I can't choose between those pies, they're all good. What's the most overrated side dish on oh, the Thanksgiving? Oh, that's not even a question. It's um, uh, yams, candied yams, and no sweet good. potatoes. And then finally, what's the best vintage Rob Lowe after school special to watch with the family after the Cowboys game is over? Oh, for sure. It's one of the most evocative, dramatic, and well thought out titles in the history of television movies. Schoolboy Father. <laughs> What I like about it is there's no doubt what it's about. Like dishwasher. You yes. know, it's, it's right in the name. It's right there. You, it, 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 I'm a boy. I'm still in school. And I'm also. And I've become a father. <laughs> well, you know what? I would cheers to that. And look <laughs> at you, Rob Lowe, taking on the wings of death. There was water, but there was also glory as you finished all 10 wings. And now there's nothing left to do but roll out the red carpet for you. This camera, this camera, this camera, let the people know what you have going on in your life. Ah, oh, well, um, I don't sweat when I do my new podcasts. Uh, literally, if you like this at all, you're gonna love Literally. Um, every interesting big star on it. And if you love Parks and Recreation, you're gonna love Parks and Recollection where we take every episode and pull the hood up and find out how we did it and um, download now. Great job. Thanks, Great man. Job. I did it. And, but it's, Dude, it's happening. You broke down the fourth wall. It's early. Do you have a busy day? You, so, get this. <laughs> Pardon my take. Oh, really? Uh, a, um, tell, uh, a, tell Big Cat I said hi. A youth conference and two scenes on my show. But other than that, it's an easy day. <laughs> the fuck is happening? Hey, what's going on, Hot Ones fans? This is Sean Evans checking in with a very exciting announcement. You know, after 16 seasons, I'd like to think that we perfected the hot sauce symphony, and now I gotta hand it to us. We perfected the packaging. It's the custom-made Hot Ones official 10-pack briefcase now available at heatness.com. Take a look inside. It's so pretty and the perfect gift for the spice lord in your life. Just get some friends, make some wings, bring some ice cream, and be careful around the eyes. Heatness.com, heatness.com, heatness.com to get your hands on the custom-made Hot Ones official 10-pack briefcase. I know I love it. Mwah. <laughs>